Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Patsy Lewis, and I'm the director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, which is located in the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to the third in a series of faculty talks. And this morning, uh, it's my particular pleasure to introduce Adrian Emmanuel Hernandez Acosta to give his talk, Introducing a Mortuary Poetics, Morning Caribbean Literature and African Diaspora Religions. Adrian is coming to us from Harvard University where he finishes, he completes his PhD and he is a postdoctoral fellow in the Hispanic Studies Department and the Cougat in Institute here at Brown. He's an interdisciplinary humanities scholar whose research explores the role played by mourning in the formation of race, gender, and sexuality through readings of African diaspora religions in Hispanophone Caribbean literature and culture. Adrian's current project provides a critical inventory of the ways in which African diaspora religions are portrayed in scenes of death and mourning within Dominican, Puerto Rican, and Cuban literature, film, and visual art. Analyzing this critical inventory leads him to propose a mortuary poetics as a fruitful framework for thinking about mourning literature and religion in the Caribbean context. I now welcome Adrian to talk. Adrian will speak for around 15 minutes after which we'll open up the discussion for comments and questions. Thank you all for coming. sharing my screen here for all of you to be able to see. I want to start by thanking uh, Patsy Lewis, Kate Goldman, Erika Durante, and everyone else at the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies for making this event possible. I also want to thank my department chair, Laura Bass, and colleagues across various departments like Michelle Clayton, Alani Hicks Bartlett, Juliet Hooker, Evelyn Hudahart, Felipe Martinez Pinzon, Kevin Kwashi, Dixa Ramirez, Ralph Rodriguez, Sarah Thomas, and Esther Whitfield for their warm welcome to Brown University. Mindful of how demanding both the beginning and middle of a semester can be, I want to thank them for the time that shared with me. It has made my transition to Brown all the smoother. In that same spirit, I want to thank everyone who has taken time out of their day to join me for this talk. You could have been elsewhere, but you chose to be here and I hope to make that choice worthwhile. So one of the fundamental things that the study of Hispanophone Caribbean literature has taught me is that there are many ways to tell a story. What I want to offer you today is a kind of story that presents my project in broad strokes. The project's central analytic of a mortuary poetics emerged as a result of reading, rereading, and rereading again, contemporary Dominican, Puerto Rican, and Cuban literature, cinema, and visual art, in other words, I was able to name the beating heart of the project and develop its critical vocabulary only after spending significant time with a set of specific poetic voices, literary and cinematic and visual forms and textures. Uh, we don't have uh, the luxury of that abundance of time this afternoon. So what I'm going to try and do is lay out the overall aims, conceptual framework and central analytic of the project and then hopefully end with two brief examples from Black Caribbean books um, from Evelyn Trujillo and Aida Cartagena Portalatil. So the aim of my project is threefold. One, to explore the role played by mourning and portrayals of African diaspora religions within Hispanophone Caribbean literature, film, and visual art. Two, to provide a critical inventory of the ways in which literary and more broadly artistic techniques are used to portray religious practices in the artistic catalog. And three, to consider what the implications of such a critical inventory might be for studies of aesthetic form, historical action, religious meaning making, and theories of racial, gendered, and sexual formation. Now, the enumeration of these aims is logical, not necessarily sequential. I go about them in the way one would braid a rope or a cord or strands of hair, 
In other words, I pursue these aims together with each and giving shape and direction to the other two. These aims and indeed the project as a whole are driven by a key tension in the ways that contemporary literary and artistic production are taking up African diaspora religions. On the one hand, Hispanophone Caribbean literary and artistic portrayals, African diaspora religions seek to circumvent social and psychic losses sustained within structures of power. And these structures of power disproportionately affect racialized feminine, queer, and trans persons. On the other hand, such portrayals nonetheless contend with the material of radically singular embodiment for which there is no resurrection. In other words, literary and cinematic characters, visual figures, and their creators appeal to African diaspora religions when seeking relief from sorrow, revenge in lieu of impossible redress, or protection in the face of imminent wounds. This sorrow, this impossibility of redress, this, eminent, this imminent violence they experienced are occasioned by the objection of feminine, queer, and trans life, as well as by the protocols of anti-Blackness, which I understand not only as a set of material practices institutionalized in racial slavery, but also as a set of discursive movements and libidinal desires regarding Blackness that extend at least as far back as the 11th century Persia and 12th century Europe. Therefore, what interests me is the political and ethical work done in these literary and artistic appeals to religious, more so than whether these appeals are answered by divine forces or spirits of the dead, per se. In this sense, the project is focused less on asserting the ontological claims of African diaspora religions, which I think is a separate and worthwhile conversation, and more about how divine forces and practices regarding the dead are called upon by literature and art to navigate current experiences and histories of death and loss marked by racialized and gendered structures of power. So to be a bit flat about it, at the end of the day, a loss is a loss. Um, there is no move on from it, but there is moving around it, through it, with it, against it. So tracing those movements, those detours in the detours of linguistic and artistic practice is what the project seeks to make a critical inventory of to highlight the second aim listed on the screen. I think the central tension in literary and artistic portrayals of African diaspora religions in Hispanophone Caribbean literature and culture speaks directly to ongoing debates regarding historical opacity, historical retrieval, and historical continuity and discontinuity that animate the study of race, gender, sexuality, literature, and psychic life today. While the aims of the project uh, give it its momentum, its orientation and analytic heft, these three categories of Hispanophone Caribbean literature, African diaspora religions and mourning, give the project its space and structure. I briefly remark on these three categories as I approach them before moving to the meat of the project that is the central analytic of mortuary poetics. My approach to uh, Hispanophone Caribbean literature is one of disforming the canon. To cite the title of Black comparative literary scholar, Ronald Judy's 90 book on African, Arabic, American slave narratives. One way I disform the canon is by taking canonical texts in Hispanophone Caribbean literature through readings they would otherwise prefer not to go through. For example, I read Alejo Carpentier's 1949 El Reino de Este Mundo, which, a which is a historical fiction said before, during, and after the Haitian Revolution, for the way in which the genre it inaugurated, namely, namely Lo Real Maravilloso, is predicated on the fungibility of a Black character's afterlife, which is to say the Black character's life after death. Fairly early on in the novel, the character Macandal, which is based on an actual historical person from the 18th century, is burned at the stake. In death, this character becomes a wing, a claw, a hoof, a bug, a spirit stirring among the people. But Matandal's stirring spirit is never allowed to establish a lasting Black New World in the text. Instead, the novel contains and siphons off the force of that spirit into its own vision of Haiti as the marvelous real, a vision that Carpentier, through his famous prologue to the novel, claims to be the distinguishing characteristic of the Americas. Therefore, the condition I wish the marvelous real as a genre characteristic of the region emerges is a mortuary poetics that is a literary way of relating to the dead and to history, 
that traffics in the fungibility of Black afterlife, the containment of Black insurgency, and the extraction of some sort, uh, some sort of sense of self from Black struggle. Another way I disform the canon and its racial protocols is by critically centering Dominican literature and putting it in conversation with US Black literary and cultural studies, understanding racial formation not only as historically dynamic and geographic specific, but also as traveling along transnational circuits shaped by colonial legacies and anti-colonial solidarity, I am in critical and caring dialogue with scholars like Silvio Torres Ayant, Cidia Hartman, Lorja Garcia Peña, and Christina Sharp. For example, in one of my chapters titled Cemeteries, I respond to Torres Ayant's claim that the Dominican Republic is historically the cradle of racial blackness in the Americas by offering a reading of contemporary Dominican literature and cinema that begin with the death of a major character. Through this reading, I argue that the cradle of which Torres Ayant speaks is also a cemetery and therefore claims to new beginnings contend with the continuities that structure those beginnings. In other words, I put Torres Ayant's insistence on a different and necessary periodization for Blackness in the hemisphere in conversation with Hartman's deconstruction of periodization in scenes of subjection to think with Dominican literature about the both and of historical continuity and discontinuity. Meanwhile, my approach to the category of African diaspora religions is very much informed by the recent work of religious studies scholar of the Dominican Republic, Brendan Jamal Thornton. He calls for the inclusion of regular religious forms per characteristic of the Caribbean into the category of African diaspora religions. Approaching the category broadly in this way allows me to analyze portrayals of practices from relatively well-known traditions, such as Regla Ocha, Santeria, Haitian Vodou, and forms of Christianity like the AME Church, which has existed in the Dominican Republic since the 1820s, as well as regional iterations of Pentecostalism, all alongside portrayals of practices from relatively well, uh, less well-known traditions, like the Cuban Abacua, Las 21 Divisiones, or Dominican Vodou, Reglas de Congo, otherwise known as Cuban Palo, Puerto, uh, Puerto Rican Sanse, and Espiritismo Cruzado, or a Caribbean recreation of the 19th century spiritism developed by the French educator, Alan Kardec. In fact, traditional anthropological distinctions between say African diaspora religions on the one hand, and various forms of Christianity on the other, whether it be folk Catholicism or evangelical Protestantism, don't hold in the Caribbean literature that I study. For example, Dominican novelist Rita Indiana Hernandez's 2015 La Mucama do Mikunle, which is already beginning to accrue a canonical status of its own, has some Pentecostals running around through the novel, sharing the same textual space. The same can be said about Puerto Rican writer Angel Lozada's 97, La Patografía, which not only includes various religious traditions, but also draws on them for its own composite form. The novel is structured like a Bible, with four gospels and an apocalypse, but all dedicated to the orishas Oya and Elegua. Therefore, my broad approach to African diaspora religions responds to this Caribbean plurality of religious practice reflected in the literature and art. Lastly, my approach to mourning is oriented by a psychoanalytic understanding of psychic life as always already traversed by the social. Instead of viewing characters' inner lives as insulated, I approach them as porous and as in a feedback loop with their environment. More specifically with regards to mourning, I draw from psychoanalysis own questioning of the division between so-called pathological and normal forms of mourning. Melancholy is not a pathological form of mourning. Rather, in following psychoanalysis own discussion on the topic, melancholy is the very way in which subjects constitute their psychic lives, precisely by incorporating loved ones into their psychic worlds in ways that then shape how they navigate the social world. Seen from this perspective, Mourning and melancholy for me are not necessarily self-absorbed, cold, withdrawn, or impoverished, but actually quite dynamic and social. In fact, I see melancholy as an intense political response that is packed with a profound capacity for self-critique and creativity. Part of what allows me to see mourning and melancholy in this way is that I think about it through a Black and queer psychoanalytics as well. I draw the very language of psychoanalytics as opposed to psychoanalysis 
from a Black literary critic or Tense Thriller's 96 essay, All the Things You Could Be by Now if Sigmund Freud's Wife Was Your Mother, Race and Psychoanalysis. I take my cue from her reworking of psychoanalysis as an exercise in self-interrogation that does not cure psychic distress, but forges ways through it through language. I also take my cue in mourning and melancholy from readings of key queer theory texts, like Judith Butler's Gender Trouble and Jose Seban Munoz's Disidentifications, both of which are deeply sh shaped by mourning and melancholy, even if or precisely because the analogy of both is to work against that mourning and melancholy. For example, for those familiar with the material, Butler introduces the concept of performativity by first setting up a long discussion about the melancholic formation of gender. Meanwhile, the entire first part of Munoz's disidentifications is titled Racial Melancholia, and a pivotal essay in his oeuvre is the 2006 essay titled Feeling Brown, Feeling Down, Latina Affect, the Performativity, performativity of Race and the Depressive Position. I've actually had an opportunity to write about this elsewhere. So this is the kind of black and queer psychoanalytic analytic literature that I think with in my approach uh, to mourning. Now to get to the central part of the project. Uh, with the project's aims and conceptual framework in mind, I offer a working definition of mortuary poetics as a study that traces how literature and art negotiate relations with the dead and with history. And I want to highlight two aspects in my development of the analytic of mortuary poetics. The first is the discursive history of the term and work of poetics itself. The second is the particular Caribbean context of my own theorization. When I first started thinking about poetics as a key term for the project, I was vaguely aware that it had a long history stretching all the way back to Aristotle's excellent lecture notes which constitute his poetics. So I thought it important to spend some time tracing that history to classical, medieval, and modern European uses of the term before trying to say something about the word myself. That research yielded some fascinating results that helped me understand what I was trying and not trying to do. What I found is that for some medieval European grammarians, poetics was a way to talk about the mental practices required to write poetry. And their discussions seemed to circle around this rhetorical trope called transumption, or the act of metaphorical transference. For them, in order to write poetry, it was necessary to transfer oneself, to imagine oneself as another. For example, imagining oneself as a flower was a transference necessary to a poetic statement like, I am blooming. And so for these medieval grammarians, poetics was about transferring oneself into the place of another, imagining oneself as another, which often required a transgression of ontological distinctions being able to move from human to flower, for instance, the case of the material that I work with, being able to move between the living and the dead. What I then noted was how this ontological transgression became a crucial point for modern discussions of poetics. And here I'm thinking particularly of French literary critic, Gerard Genet, theorization of metalepsis, which means the same thing, assumption just derived from the Greek instead of the Latin. For Genet, poetics wasn't just about imagining oneself as another, but about actually moving between worlds. He was very interested in moments in literature, film, and theater when the fourth wall, as it were, was broken, but in a very particular way that occasioned a breach and a transference from the world internal to the text, screen, or stage to the world in which the text, screen, or stage circulated. Tracing this history of poetics highlighted for me how central ontological transgression is for the mortuary poetics of the Hispanophone literature art that I analyze, an ongoing transference between the living and the dead, between humans and spirits, between the past and the present, all precisely through the poetic use of language. But I quickly set aside European theorizations of poetics in order to situate my own theorization of the term within a Black Caribbean context, such as Martinican writer Edward Glissant's Poetic of Relation. Doing so brought me back to the heart of the problematic in mortuary, mortuary poetics for Hispanophone Caribbean literature and culture by asking how imaginative, imaginative recreation of a world takes place when the world is rife with death and riveted by loss. And again, not just in any general existential sense, but in a historically grounded way that lets some more than others fall away according to a host of markers such as race, gender, and sexuality. <clears throat> 
As Dominican scholar Silvio Torres Ayon asks at the beginning of his own the intellectual history of the Caribbean, and I quote, what literature and thought can come from a civilization that is aware of its catastrophic beginning? So profound and pervasive has been the catastrophe that one wonders how Hispanophone Caribbean literature and culture navigate it. How do its linguistic and linguistic techniques contend with this negative force? So here's one example. Evelyn Trio's poem, Dom Pri, Evelyn Trio being Michelle, uh, Michelle Roth Trio's sister. Uh, Tampri means please in Haitian Creole. It was written in the wake of the 2010 Haitian earthquake, and yet it reads like a supplicant lament for the ongoing history of death and loss suffered by Haitians, both on the island and in diaspora. What begins as an address to another in the form of a polite request, please don't, becomes an interior, an interior monologue about the relationship of the poet's own words to death and loss. And although January 12th, which is close to the bottom of the, of the text, temporarily marks the death and loss of which the poet speaks, or rather of which she wishes not to speak, we cannot quite anchor that day in precise year nor to any particular seismic event. Does it refer to the geological earthquake in January of 2010 or to the political earthquake occasioned by the end of the Haitian Revolution in January 1804, or to the apocalyptic events of Christopher Columbus's successful departure from Hispaniola in January of 1493 would have. Like a boat unmoored, the poem itself is set on historically open waters. Moreover, the poet's interior monologue is turned inside out, or rather exhibits an interiority that is not self-enclosed, let alone sovereign. At once intensely aware of herself, her own mouth from which unrecognizable poetry pours and fingertips to which scraps of grief thick, and yet emptied of her own volition, the poet finds herself to have become the vehicle by which mourning speaks like a team of loi that since that day have possessed her. More so than any other poetic vehicle in the poem, it is the poet's voice and body that bear the poem's tenor of ongoing mourning. Where those mourning crowds quickly and without her wanting, Aida Cartagena Portalatin's mourning in her 1967 poetry cycle of elegies, La Tierra Escrita, begins in desolation that actively seeks company. For Portalatin, the site at which record, witness, testimony, memory converge is the cemetery but not just cemetery as designated space for the burial of the dead. Rather, the cemetery is tierra escrita or written land. That is anywhere that the dead abide in language. In the first elegy titled Elegy for Elegies, Portalatin makes a connection between cemetery and written land explicit when describing what it was like to bring two young girls to the cemetery. This description ends with the realization that the cemetery is an office of public relations, and ultimately, uh, nombres y fechas, esa es la tierra escrita, names and dates, that's the written, written land. While the image of a public relations office resonates with the idea of mortuary politics, the reference to names and dates as synecdoche for the cemetery points to mortuary poetics. Or to put it more precisely, the synecdoche names and dates complicates any easy separation of politics from poetics and vice versa. With stylistic markers such as caps lock that characterize 1960s and 70s experimental writing, Porta Latin's prologue is also an epilogue, para prologo or epilogo, read the reads the title atop the first page, suggesting that what follows the prologue does not fundamentally change the situation in which the text initially finds itself. Instead, the aim remains a kind of gathering of past and future generations in a textual cemetery. Written in the wake of the failed 1965 revolt to defend the first radically elected president after Trujillo's 31 year dictatorship, the prologue to this textual cemetery concludes with a moment of self-criticism. Pienso fuimos algo cobardes, no es para mea culpa que escribimos, sino como escribimos, esto poesía o qué, montaje lo fellini corta interrumpiendo, añadiendo, cortando, volviendo a interrumpir y todo solo con el pensamiento. 
implicitly criticizing her involvement in an earlier Dominican literary movement known as La Poesia Sorprendida. Porta Latin calls for a kind of poetic neorealism that nonetheless circumvents fixed notions of time and space by way of montage that is cutting, interrupting, adding, cutting, interrupting again, La Tierra Escrita becomes a textual cemetery. The Mirabal sisters who were brutally murdered by Trujillo's henchmen in 1960 appear in the sixth elegy alongside Porta Latin's own dead mother, or perhaps godmother in the second elegy as quote, una de las grandes mamás del mundo. De su vientre nacieron siete hijos que serían en Dallas, Memphis, or Birmingham, un problema racial. The juxtaposition of asynchronous political and personal histories of death assembles a montage of spaces. The image of a maternal figure giving birth to children who are considered, quote, a racial problem across named US cities highlights an ongoing gendered history of the Middle Passage. As Christina Sharp will note some 40 years after Porta Latin, quote, what kind of mother mothering is it if paired with knowledge of the possibility of the violent and quotidian death of one's child. As we consensus with Trio and Porta Latin, mortuary poetics in a Black Caribbeanist context finds itself in need of linguistic and artistic techniques that represent the very ongoing quality of the reverberations of death and loss, the affect and interpretation of which repeatedly turn back to the Middle Passage. Mortuary poetics in these Caribbean cases becomes less a practice of opening linguistic possibility by imagining oneself in another's position, as was the case for the medieval grammarians I mentioned earlier, and more practice of letting language be opened by an ongoing tarrying with death and loss, whether that is through Yo's through, through poetic vehicles of speaking spirits or through Porta Latin's poetic structures of montage. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Adrian, um, for that very interesting talk. Um, do we have, the floor is now open for questions and comments. I can see that we have a very, an audience that is very much part of your discipline. So hopefully you'll get some meaningful comments. Okay, one moment. Um, Amanda Gonzalez is asking whether you're seeing any relation between witnessing and mortuary poetics. I, um, that's, thank you, Amanda, for that question. I, I think I would first want to ask like, uh, what you probably think when you think of witnessing, right? My mind kind of goes to, uh, to history, um, to record keeping. And so in that sense, I do think that mortuary poetics is involved in that process, but not necessarily to, or primarily to uh, supplement a historical record that has failed to include voices otherwise uh, uh, marginalized, but to kind of work through some affective aspects of, of the losses of that history. So that, I guess that again, kind of an answer to that question in that way. Thank you. Okay, please feel free to ask your questions. Um, Adrian, since you're comparing um, African, basically African religions, and their retentions and formations in an African-American context with a Caribbean context. Can you speak to some of the differences you've seen in terms of, uh, and similarities in terms of myths around death and mourning, um, and also how they're treated in the different literatures from the two broad regions? The two broad regions being? The US and the Caribbean. And this is making a big assumption that there's some similarity across the Caribbean. So well you know when I when I first when I first heard you you know speak the mention the question, the thing that came to mind was actually that internal to the Caribbean there's lots of differences. Mm -hmm. uh, one particular example that comes uh, to mind is that um, in ethnographies of Dominican Vodou it is stressed that 
the, the dead are not used to work, do work with. Uh, there's like lua, luases uh, or divine forces that uh, one works with to do particular tasks. So the dead, one's dead are venerated, but not employed, so to speak, which is very different from say, you know, spiritism or, or Cuban palo. Um, so even within the Caribbean, there's a lot of diversity about how to relate to the dead. Mm -hmm. And I mentioned that particular example because I think with Cartagena Porta Latin, we see a very interesting, I think, poetic uh, misuse of the, of the religious tradition. Right. Rather than keeping to a certain uh, orthodox practice of Dominican Vodou that wouldn't work with the dead, she's actually kind of using the poetry to to engage with them. Right. So that's another aspect, I think, of the project, which is not to simply trace one to one correspondences between the practices themselves and the way that the literature is using them, but to see how the literature is creatively misusing it and therefore showing us something different about the practices, perhaps. Okay. Thank you for that response. Um, we're still inviting the audience to give questions to, to, or make comments on the, on the um, presentation. Okay, there's one second, Adrian. Okay, Lucia Hulsetta um, says, thank you for your presentation, Adrian. Early on, you observed that literary texts often appeal to ADR when they are seeking some kind of release from some landscape of violence, and that you have some concerns about the politics of those uses and the attachments that may underwrite them. With that in mind, could you say more about how you see your work intervening in the historiography of ADR, both within religious studies and in adjacent, adjacent fields like Black queer studies, American studies, et cetera? And the question is in the, in the Q&A. So if, you, if my reading is confusing, you can take a look. No, no, no. It's just it's a it's a big question. So I was just marking some notes down. Yeah. Uh, hey, Lucia. <laughs> um, so uh, the first thing I would say is, you know, something else that I'm currently working on is kind of historicizing the imbrication of uh, race, religion and gender and sexuality in kind of a, a black, queer and queer of color kind of uh, scholarship. So I'm thinking mainly of Tinsley's work. Right, Isilis Mirrors, I'm thinking of Roberto Strongman's Queer Black Atlantic Religion, and try to kind of see um, if there's a pattern in the way that the religious traditions are, are used and mined to imagine other worlds, to imagine other possibilities regarding gender and sexuality. And what's really interesting for me is how the work that I'm doing with the Hispanic and Caribbean literature. Um, is that a similar type of move is being done, but it's being done with, with very clear anti-Black protocols. And so I refer back to, you know, the way that Macandal is being used in uh, Alejo Carpentier's El Reino de Este Mundo. So I have these two kind of bodies of literature and seeing very similar discursive moves taking place and wondering uh, where critical conversation could, could start from there. So very much uh, uh, wanting to, to think with um, current interest among Black queer and queer of color scholars around religion and wanting to provide a historical context so that we don't repeat um, some of the discursive moves that have happened before. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian. There's a question here from Michelle Clayton. And she's thanking you for this beautiful talk and is, is asking, knowing of your interest in both music and translation, I wonder if you could talk a little about poems that pattern mourning that have traveled into music and our performance and what role rhythm plays in the poetry or its translation into more determinedly performative forms. Uh, thanks Michelle for that question. Um, Actually, another version of this talk uh, 
I would have used um, La Mucama de Miculé as my as my central example. And I think that one kind of speaks more directly to the question of moving between um, artistic forms, whether those are performing arts or textual, because as, as you know, Rita Indiana Hernandez is a musician uh, as, as well as a novelist. And uh, the, the rhythm of the writing very much reminds me of the fast pacedness of the merengue, right? That she, you know, plays. So what that, what that does, what that uh, offers uh, for our think about, um, you know, mortuary poetics is something I wanna continue to think about for sure. What I can say is that that Dominican uh, exchange between different art forms actually has a long history in Dominican literature. Um, thinking of Manuel Rueda, who himself was a musician as well as, as, a, as, a, as a poet um, and as a short story writer. And in his writing, um, in his poetic writing, he very much draws from musical forms, literal musical staffs to organize his poetry. So there, there's a lot there in terms of thinking across media and what um, thinking about that explicitly might do for mortuary poetics. Thank you. Lohia Garcia Pena is saying, this is a wonderful presentation, Adrian, thank you. Could you talk about how mortuary poetics helps us understand the tensions between literature and religion? I wonder if uh, if you could say more about what you mean by tension, because <laughs> uh, I could I could take that in different directions. But I'm really curious what you're thinking of. Would you like to to respond? Okay, um, she has. She's thinking more of the productive tensions. Oh, you know, it's um, the productive tensions between literature and religion. I think in the Caribbean, they have th those two, uh, the religious and the literary have really walked hand in hand, right? Uh, in, a, in another chapter that I'm working on, actually, um, that I'm editing, I, I trace the Cuban Abacua, which is this uh, religious fraternity in Cuba. Um, through 19th and 20th century literature. And so many, many times, although the, the religious practice itself was criminalized across different political governments, they were like hiding in place in the literature. And not only in the literature, but also in the plastic arts, in the music. I mean, there wouldn't be rumba without the, the Cuban Abacua. So um, I guess the productive tension would be how they each kind of supplement each other through different political kind of moments, whether that's a criminalization of black religion uh, or you know, the, the, the loss of a record, right? Or the limits of a, of a historical record and the literature not only supplementing that history, but also doing a, amazing uh, poetic and creative work with it. Okay. Thank you. Felipe Martinez Pinzon is saying, Adrian, thank you for your very engaging presentation. I'm wondering about the spaces themselves where mortuary practices happen in your work. Cemeteries, obviously, but others. And what histories they had half different to the one given by religious rituals. In some, are particular spaces chosen for these practices? Well, regard, I, I thank you for that question, Felipe, because with regard to the cemeteries, this is a, a next step that I would like to take in the research, um, which is to really kind of historicize why certain uh, Dominican Vodou practices take place in the cemetery. And not to take for granted that that, uh, that connection, that geographic connection is to be assumed, right? Like what historical forces uh, led to to that because um, even today there's a policing of public space, particularly of cemeteries in the, in the DR because of its association with uh, uh, particular ritual practices, 
right? So actually you're pointing to a next step in, in the research that I, that I would like to do. Okay. Esther Whitfield says, thank you very much for your presentation, Adrian. I'm interested in the extent to which contemporary funeral practices in the Hispanophone Caribbean enter your work. I'm thinking particularly of an essay by Josiana Arroyo, published a few years ago about a funeraria marine in San Juan, where the bodies of a number of well-known figures, musician boxers, were part of a stage tableau of their funerals. Josiana relates this to Oler's painting, El Bellorio. If the question is too specific, or if you don't know Royo's article, we can talk about this another time. We definitely have to talk about Royo's article, but just kind of to keep uh, the conversation a bit more, a bit more open for others to be able to join. What I will say in response to the first part of your question on the funeral practices in the Caribbean is that what I don't want to uh, leave you with is the image of some sort of somber or sad, uh, you know crying type of image. You know, the funerals can be very festive. <laughs> Mourning can actually be an occasion for people to gather and to, and to do all sorts of other types of effective work. And I'm really trying to think about the vitality and the range of affects of the mortuary space um, alongside this kind of psychoanalytic understanding of mourning, more so than mourning as, you know, a, a particular performance or or a set of gestures that we might recognize, right? There's certainly crying, there's certainly sadness, there's certainly dejection, but there's laughter. Um, there's, there's movement, there's, there's all sorts of other things going on. So, so that's where I would kind of begin this broader conversation about, you know, what does mourning look like within a Caribbean context? Well, at the same time, wanting to insist that there can be a Caribbean sadness, you know, I'm sad in all sorts of ways, and it has to do with, with my Caribbeanness, right? But there's a way in which I think the space, the region uh, circulates um, musically uh, and in touristic kind of imaginaries where it's just considered, uh, you know, paradise, right? There's no room for those other types of affects. So I'm, I'm trying to think about, about that. I, I just want to to ask if, I mean, if you're looking at English, the, the English Caribbean at all, but also how you see practices evolving over time um, and the extent to which these funereal practices are function in a more traditional religious space, but may have underlying you know, um, resonances of more traditional African religions, although that may not be consciously operating, you know, in that space. I'm thinking in Jamaica, and I know it's not something that's specific to Jamaica at all. Um, there have become these very elaborate um, performances around the funerals, like especially in poorer communities defined by violence. And um, when, you know, people who die, who have some prominence, or even when children die, like I've seen, you know, an elaborate um, funeral procession, like, you know, a little castle and with this, you know, the body of the child. And I'm, I'm trying to understand what's going on here. And if that's something that comes into your work, but that's something that seems to be fairly recent, fairly new. You know, another example in the in the Dominican material that that I um, that I analyzed this amazing film Cocote, which is um, a film from in 2017, director Nelson Carlos de los Santos Arias. Um, and one of one of the themes that is explored in the film is this tension between how different religious practices in the Caribbean relate to the dead, right? So the main character is, uh, is, is an evangelical Christian who assumes that there is no connection with the dead, that once the person dies, there is no way to communicate. And then uh, he he's, has to go back to his hometown where the rest of his family is very much involved in Dominican Vodou practices where that is not the case, where relationships to the dead are not only assumed, but like are mandated because there's a, a certain responsibility that the living have towards the dead. 
And so the film actually explores the types of tensions that arise when within one family, one Dominican family, you have these competing kind of religious uh, ethics regarding how to relate to the dead. And I, I would suspect that that's true, you know, across the Caribbean, that that experience of, you know, family members having different thoughts about what to do um, when someone dies, like really come to a come to a head, whether that's the DR, whether that's Jamaica, whether that's um, Martinique, you know, I, I, it, it's definitely something that also points to, I think, not a problem of the Caribbean, but a problem of the way that folks study religion and bring that to bear on the Caribbean, which is you can't assume the neat distinctions, right, of Christians on the one side and uh, Boudouissants on the other. There's a lot of exchange, a lot of uh, multi, multiple religious affiliation in the region. Right, that leads to these kinds of like, well, um, you you go to church, but then you have these elaborate like processions with maybe some other priests as well, you know, as inside the church. Right, I think that's possible uh, in the Caribbean because it doesn't assume um, such neat separations. Okay, thank you for that. Laura Bass is saying thank you, Adrian, for your beautiful talk. I know your course next semester will be precisely on this topic. And I wanted to ask you about your approach to mourning in the classroom as such a naturally necessarily heavy topic. In answering Esther, you've already in some sense anticipated my question by pointing out the joyful celebratory aspects of mourning practices. But could you say more about your pedagogy of death and mourning? There's there's a whole um, there's a whole playlist <laughs> that is that is part of the course for this spring, and one of the things that um, I was worried was that I was going to be finding you know sad lament music dirges uh, when it came to the musical component of how the Caribbean responds and relates to to death and to mourning, and what I found is like that I was able to collect an entire uh, playlist of, of salsa, of rumba, of um, genres of music that are meant to be danced, meant to be moved. Uh, so, mm -hmm. so what's what's interesting about um, the musical component is that it is actually helping me think of this broader question of pedagogy when it comes to these heavy topics, right? That it it it's not to make light of the issue. But, but there's a certain, again, a certain vitality that comes to um, Caribbean notions of, you know, um, historical continuity, relations with the dead. Uh, I mean, one particular song, it, the, the chorus more or less goes, uh, uh, details the fact that, that the, the dead person that they're mourning is actually dancing with them in the space, right? Heard the music and just got up and started moving around. Right, so there's there's perhaps um, a pedagogy there, and, and even perhaps a therapy where there's a possibility to continue to relate to the lost loved one, even if it's in a different form, right? And kind of something that is that I'm I'm really trying to put my finger on with regard to how I'm approaching mourning, which is, you know, on the one hand, recognizing that there has been a separation, there has been a loss. I won't be able to hug the person that I lost in the same form that they existed, right? But that doesn't mean that I don't have other kinds of mediating relationships, whether that's through a song, a book, a poem, a word. So that begins to kind of, I do this, this therapeutic and pedagogical work that, that I think the music component of, this, of, the, of the course is helping me to think about. And just to give a little plug for Adrian's course, his course next semester would be um, a Spanish language course exploring the relationship between mourning and experimental form in Hispanophone Caribbean literature. And he has just said, as he just explained, there'd be lots of music. Um, do we have any other questions? Um, Okay. There's one in the chat, yes, actually. I just noticed. Hi, Adrian. I will bother you with questions all day, but otherwise, others on the queue should obviously have priority. I'd be interested in hearing you talk more about how you are conceptualizing history 
historicity, sorry, within the terms of this project and its method of interpretation and also its pedagogical method to read the classroom and the text as something that works on its reader. I notice how you both discussed the importance of historical context for appeals to ADR, while troubling notions of historical transparency, linearity, retrieval, et cetera. Yeah, just Can you quick... just remind us of what ADR means? Oh, A ADR, African diaspora religions. Uh, so I, just a, a quick response to that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, there's, you're, you're putting your finger on attention and the kind of my approach to history. On the one hand, I am invested in, in setting the historical record straight, so to speak, uh, particularly with, uh, you know, the study of Dominican Vodou and also Dominican literature within the Caribbean canon, right? Because I think that's an important kind of historical work that we need to do and that actually yields very important um, uh, canon disformations, right? But at the same time, I'm also sensitive and wanting to explore um, the way that the texts themselves are, are messing with historicity, messing with concepts of time, right? Where it's not linear, it's considered a loop. It could be considered a montage. It could be considered, um, you know, any other sort of, of, of a form of relating um, to the past. Right, and, and wanting to hold these two things in tension and perhaps uh, letting the, the way that the sources themselves are theorizing um, relationships to history can um, inform my own practice if I want to do the, the, the historical kind of work that I also want to do. Okay, do we have any more questions? I don't see any more questions, but um, before I thank you, I would just like to um, mention that we, next Wednesday, October 27th, we're having a discussion on Haitian migration um, between 12 and one. And just want to plug that for people who can attend. Um, so let me see, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed a, a question from Gabrielle Carl. Oh, thanks for your presentation, Adrian. Does your analytic account for rage, sorry, account for rage in mourning in the face of collective death? I'm thinking not only Man Kadal's rage and thirst for revenge before and after death, but also the rage that undergirds Ramos Otero's Nobleza de Sangre, facing God for the AIDS pandemic. I'm curious about your thoughts on individual versus collective mourning, life pandemics, and how the pain or rage of mourning can mobilize affect towards social change. Yeah, I also have a two part answer to this one rage. Absolutely, as part of mourning uh, and the way I'm thinking about it, it's interesting because, um, you know, reading Butler's uh, uh, scenes of subjection, uh, you know, they're very clear that it's melancholy going to get us anywhere politically. Right? And I actually had a, a conversation with them about this, where they're very adamant about that. And instead, they insisted on rage, right, as a politically effective affect, right. And it just struck me because after reading Gender Trouble, it's like, well, what uh, what allowed Gender Trouble to even become was the way that, in my opinion, they mobilized uh, mourning, right, to do some critical work around around gender performativity. Now, in terms of the 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 work that I'm kind of analyzing, I go back again to the film Cocote. Um, the, you know, uh, spoiler alert, the, the narrative actually ends with the main character avenging his father's death by, by, killing, the, by killing his father's killer, right? But the, I think the really interesting ethical aspect of the film is that the film doesn't end there. So it's not quite a simple revenge narrative that's motivated by rage. 
rather uh, the film ends with the with the protagonist back where we found him at the beginning of of the of the novel, which is just being a landscaper for somebody else in, in Santo Domingo. And so it, it raises real deep ethical questions about, well, um, what is, what is, what is, once, once the revenge has been taken, what then? The law still stands. And there's a melancholy that still needs to be dealt with, even as the rage kind of leads to some sort of action, right? So that's the other kind of side of how we think about rage and mourning together that, that is important to kind of uh, uh, keep in mind. Thank you, Adrian. Do we have any more questions? Okay, I'd really like to thank Adrian for this very engaging talk and to our audience for coming, feeling some very interesting questions and carrying on the conversation. And thank you so much, Adrian. And again, welcome to Brown. And I really hope this is a productive year for you. And thank you to all of those of you who have attended.